Okay, good morning, everyone. Yeah, so good morning to those who are online as well. Um, we'll begin with a word of prayer. If someone could lead us in prayer, please. Maybe someone online can lead us in prayer if us, no one for, seems to be. Go ahead. Thank you, Father. Your name is mighty Lord. We are going to learn your word of God, Father. Father, we you give each one your wisdom, Father. Your name is great, Father. Father, we lead us, Lord, this section. Your name is mighty. Thank you, Lord. You accept prayer in Jesus' name. Pray, Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. So um, we covered the book of Judges last class. Uh, we looked at how um, intermingling with the locals, yoking themselves with the locals, led to a lot of um, uh, sinfulness. It also led to their destruction and oppression. So we, we saw many negative things in the book of Judges last time. Now today we would be covering the book of Ruth, which is also directly connected to the time of the Judges. Because if you were to look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, you will see the opening statement in the days when the Judges ruled. So the events um, of the book of Ruth also take place during the time period of the judges itself. Now, what do we know about the compilation of this particular book? Um, based on the kind of Hebrew grammar and syntax which is used in this uh, book of Ruth, the general impression is that it was not written during the time of the judges. It was probably written during the time of David uh, because the, you know, the Hebrew language had evolved a little more. And uh, so the kind of grammar, the kind of syntax which is used in the book of Ruth is more in line with what was uh, used during the time of the monarchy, during the time of David and Solomon. So the general assumption is that whoever compiled this book uh, must have done this during the time of, the, of David. Even if you look at the genealogy, which is there at the very end of the book of Ruth, you will see that the genealogy is only there up to King David's name. So most probably it was during his time that this um, book was written down. Okay, So with just that brief introduction, let's actually get into the book of Ruth. We will go through all the four chapters and uh, touch upon the main highlights. So uh, looking at Ruth chapter 1, uh, verse 1, which serves as an introduction. Uh, if we could have someone read out for us, Ruth 1, 1. Yeah, just so that we don't waste time if someone... Now it have... came to pass in the days of... in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Yeah, so in the time of Judges, because the people were not following the Lord, uh, the Lord was not able to protect them, provide for them uh, because of their sinfulness. So that is why we see a famine in this land. You know, they were supposed to be enjoying prosperity, but because of their own sinfulness, uh, there is a famine upon the entire land and a man in the uh, in a place called Bethlehem, you know, which literally the word Beth means house and Le Le Lechem is basically the word bread. So literally Bethlehem means house of bread. So in the house of bread, there is famine. And so this man uh, decides that it's difficult for them to continue living in that place. So he decides to sell all of his fields all of his property and moved to the land of Moab. Um, did someone ask a question? No. Okay. Yeah. So um, now um, the Lord was not actually in favor of Moab. 
we see him you know passing a judgment against them in deuteronomy chapter 23 uh, so probably it was not a wise decision for this person elimelech to be shifting to moab um so maybe it would have been better for him to trust in the lord and continue staying on in uh, you know uh, bethlehem rather than moving uh, but then because of the famine maybe he was unable to you know grow crops anymore so the crops are not growing then he cannot sell the crops and uh, you know earn for his family uh, so the family would not have enough to eat so things had become rather desperate and so he thought it would be a better decision to sell his land and his property and shift to moab even though god is not in favor of moab uh, why was the lord not in favor of moab let's look at deuteronomy chapter 23 if we could have someone read out for us verses 3 to 6 deuteronomy 23 verses 3 to 6 we will see why the lord spoke against the uh, moab and what he said specifically regarding the moabites no no ammonite or moabite or any their descendants may enter the assembly of the lord not even in the 10th generation for they did not come to meet you with the bread and water or your way when you come out of egypt and they heard hired balam son of beor from pethor in Ar- aram nehera nehera am and pronounce pronounce or a curse on you however the lord your god would not would not listen to balam but turn the curse into the blessing of for you because the lord your god loves you do not seek the treaty of friendship with them as long as you live so because of their attitude towards the um israelites the lord says uh, that he does not even give permission for any of their descendants to enter you know into the uh, premises of the tabernacle and he also says do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live so the lord is against any kind of yoking between the moabites and the israelites and yet in spite of this commandment elimelech chooses to go to moab and live over there and then uh, we get to know that you know when he when they go over there he dies uh, and then um, after his death his sons they marry the local women even though the lord has said that there should be no kind of a partnership between them and uh, so his uh, sons they marry uh, moabite women and then uh, they also die both the sons also die so now naomi who is an old lady she is left as a widow she has no support uh, you know any longer and she looks at her daughters in law who are quite young and she doesn't want their future to be destroyed and so uh, she tells them you know it would be better if you go back to your homes you know so that you can get remarried once again and uh, so she is willing uh, to return back to jerusalem um to return back to the to the land of israel completely alone completely penniless on her own um because of her kind attitude her daughters in law are reluctant to you know leave her all by herself uh, but then she insists and uh, so orpa one of the daughters in law agrees to go back to her own people so that you know she can remarry and have a future and a hope on the other hand the other daughter in law this is the commitment that she makes so if someone could read out for us ruth chapter 1 verse 16 but ruth replied do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you where you go i will go and where you stay i will stay your people will be my people and your god my god so um ruth makes a commitment and she says you know where you go i will go where you stay i will stay 
she knows that once they come back to the land of Israel, there's not going to be any luxurious bungalow waiting for them. Uh, um, uh, Naomi is practically penniless. There is no support. There is no hope. So she knows that she's not going to be having a good time when she returns, uh, when, she, when, she, when she goes to Israel along with this old lady. But she doesn't want to leave her completely helpless and alone. And so she volunteers and she says, it's all right. I will come back with you. Where you stay, I will stay. If you're going to be staying in a hut, no problem. I'll stay along with you. But then she also makes another commitment here, a spiritual commitment. You know, we, uh, we who have read the book of Judges last week, we know that they were completely into idolatry. So Ruth could have quite comfortably come back to Israel with Naomi along with her idols and continued with her idol worship. But she makes a choice and she says, she says, your God, you know, will be my God. So she makes a conscious um, uh, commitment to give up her idols and become a follower of Yahweh. This is not something that she needed to do. She was showing kindness to her old uh, mother-in-law by coming back with her. But there was no need to make a spiritual commitment as well. But she chooses to do that. It makes me wonder why. I mean, those who are into idolatry are very comfortable with their idol worship. So why would she make a sacrifice like that? Probably because of the kind of example which, you know, old Naomi had set in that home. Naomi uh, probably was a sincere, faithful follower of Yahweh and probably had talked to her daughter-in-law's daughters-in-law about Yahweh. So Ruth is now convinced in her heart that if she's going to go back to the land of Israel, she may as well take protection again under the God of Israel. And so she makes this very... Um, wise decision which actually has a great uh, impact on her future if she had come back with her mother-in-law with her idols her life would have gone nowhere in fact even naomi's life would have gone nowhere but because of this commitment that she made even though all the israelites are busy worshiping idols she chooses to become a follower of yahweh so we see this very um, important you know commitment that she makes uh, which leads to a lot of uh, future results for her. Um, so uh, that introduction is given to us about Ruth and Naomi in the first chapter. And then we move into chapter two. Uh, for us to understand what happens in chapter two, maybe you know we would uh, need to look at uh, some other background. But let's begin with Ruth chapter two, verse two. Ruth 2 verse 2, if someone could read out. So Ruth and Moab said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean hills of grains after him, in whose sight I may find favor. If you and notice, yeah, she's uh, over here, she's referred to as Ruth the Moabite. Again and again, throughout this entire book, you will see her referred not just as Ruth, but Ruth the Moabite. Again, Again, this, uh, this detail is specified to bring out the fact that this woman is a foreigner and she is a foreigner who is not uh, acceptable in the eyes of Yahweh. Because the, Yahweh has very clearly said, up to the 10th generation, I do not even want a descendant you know, from a Moabite background to enter into my tabernacle. That is the kind of person that she is. And again and again, this, this fact is stressed in this book. So a woman like that has chosen, has humbled herself to become a follower of Yahweh. And this is what she says to her uh, mother-in-law. She says, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. What does she mean? What is she talking about? So for us to understand that, we would probably have to look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22. So if someone could read out for us Leviticus 23, verse 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the edges of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. 
You are to leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Amen. Yes. So it says over here that when uh, at the harvest time, when all the harvesters are, you know, uh, plucking the grain stalks and taking them to the barn, the Lord gives a, a piece of advice, a commandment. He says, don't take out every single, you know, grain stalk. The ones which are near the edges of the field, leave them alone because there'll be poor people who can come and take that. And he also says another thing. He says, um, do not gather the gleanings of your harvest. So when the harvesters are plucking up the grain stalks and tying them up into bundles, you know, some of the grain stalks will fall onto the ground. And the Lord says, leave it alone. Let, you know, let the poor people come and take those. So the Lord says, this, the ed, near the edges of your field, whatever is there, and whatever the harvesters have dropped on the ground, you know, while they were tying up the bundles, leave it alone for the poor and for the foreigner, because the poor and the foreigner have no, have no fields. They have no sustenance. So show kindness and mercy to them is what God you know, commands. So now Ruth is saying, you know, because obviously Naomi and Ruth do not have any job. They have no, you know, money. And so she says, let me go into the field of someone. And if someone, you know, if I can have favor in someone's eyes, if someone can show mercy to a foreigner and that to a Moabite, if someone can show mercy to someone like me, maybe they'll allow me to follow behind them. And if anything falls to the ground, you know, they will allow me to pick it up. So here is a foreigner stepping out into the fields of the Israelites during a very evil time, during the time of the judges when women had no safety. And moreover, Ruth and Naomi have no male protection. You know, the, uh, the men working in those fields will probably be a little more careful uh, with a woman worker if they know that there's male protection because, you know, there'll, there'll be repercussions if they touch her. But for a person like this who has nobody to watch out for her, it's a very risky thing that she's volunteering to do. And she's going through all of this for the sake of an old woman. You know, she could have gone back to her home the way Orpa went back. But this is a sacrifice and a commitment that she makes. It shows the quality of her character. Here is a woman who is not like the Israelites of the time of the judges. Here is a woman who is different, who is setting a standard. So she's putting herself through all of this sacrifice for the sake of an old mother-in-law. It really must have caught the attention of Yahweh you know, to see this. And um, uh, so uh, she chooses to go into the fields. And then uh, because of her commitment and loyalty towards her mother-in-law, also because of her commitment that she has made to Yahweh, Yahweh watches out for her. And so without realizing it, she goes to the field of a person who is godly and God-fearing. She, in fact, goes to the field of a person who is actually a relative of, of Naomi's. She does not even know all this. She just simply goes and the Lord guides her footsteps so that she ends up in the correct place. And there in Ruth chapter 2, you know, verses 8 to 12, uh, we see uh, the conversation which takes place between Boaz and Ruth. And uh, so he speaks to her kindly and he says to her, in uh, Ruth chapter 2, verse 8, he says to her, stay here with the women who work for me. You know, so there are women workers here. So you stay along with them. That way you'll be safe. And then he also says, I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. So, you know, he's concerned for her favor. And he says to her, you know, when you're thirsty, you can go and drink. And, in, uh, and uh, when they're having their food, he says, you know, come and, you know, share in the food. So he shows kindness to this person, this foreigner. And so she says to him in verse 10, why have I found such favor in your eyes uh, that you notice me a foreigner? And this is the reply which Boaz um, you know, gives. He says, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother how you left your homeland, how you came to live with a uh, 
with the people you did not know before and then you know boaz says may the lord repay you for what you have done may he you know may you be richly rewarded by the lord the god of israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge so the wisest thing which um, ruth did this she came to take shelter under the wings of yahweh the living god and boaz is impressed by the commitment of this lady and he says may the lord reward you for the you know kindness which you have shown towards your mother in law and also the loyalty which you have shown towards yahweh uh, so he blesses her with those words and uh, we get to know a little bit about what kind of a person boaz is you know through this dialogue we get to know that he is not like the other men of the book of judges you know whose um moral caliber was so low uh, you know he on the other hand is a godly man who cares for his laborers who provides for them who in fact you know when he, when he enters and enters into the field he greets them with a godly greeting it shows the kind of person that he also is so basically in this evil time dark time of the judges we see that god has reserved a remnant a small group of people for himself whose hearts are still loyal to him even in the darkest times in history the lord has always reserved a small remnant for himself a small portion of people who have stayed loyal and true to him and through them deliverance always comes so even here in this time of judges we see these two characters in contrast with all the other people and um, then you know coming to um, uh, naomi naomi is very happy that uh, you know um, things have turned out well uh, when uh, ruth turns uh, turns up home uh, with an ipha of um, of grain that's supposed to be like um 13 kgs of grain she comes back home with 13 kgs of grain and her, ma- her mother in law is overjoyed and she says where did you work that will be in ruth chapter 2 verse 19 onwards where did you work blessed be the man who took notice of you um and then uh, ruth explains and uh, naomi is very happy when she gets to know that it is boas field where she is working and this is what she says in verse 20 The Lord bless him Naomi said to her daughter in law he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead okay so here Naomi says you know the Lord has not stopped showing kindness to the living and to the dead by the living she is referring obviously to herself and to her daughter daughter in law the lord is showing kindness to the living in what way is he showing live, uh, kindness to the dead we'll get to that later but let's go back to what naomi actually said from her own mouth when she first came back to israel in ruth chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 if someone could read out ruth 1 20 and 21 but she said to them do not call me naomi call me mara for all mighty has dealt very bitterly with me i went out full and the lord has brought me home again empty why do you call me Na- naomi since the lord has testified against me and the almighty has afflicted me so here there are allegations which naomi makes against the almighty god she says you know my name is supposed to be naomi which means happiness pleasantness joy but that is not my story so stop calling me naomi call me mara because mara is bitter uh, and she says call me mara because the almighty has made my life very bitter but was it really the almighty who made her life bitter it was her husband who took them to moab and went you know so when we are in times of deep pain sometimes we utter things from our mouth which are wrong which are false we blame god for decisions taken by humans i i do not know to what extent naomi would have had a say because women did not really have much say you know in the uh, family decision making but her husband took that decision 
and she had to pay the price for it you know so he took the entire family and went to moab and over there um, god's protection was not upon them he died his sons died and uh, these women of the family were left you know without any protection it was not the lord who afflicted it was her husband's decision you know which brought this misery upon them so in a way it was wrong for her to blame the lord and say the lord has afflicted me the almighty has brought misfortune upon me so the first lesson that we can learn is when we are going through a time of deep pain genuine pain i mean you know we go through some really horrible situations in our life when you're going through that don't say the lord has done this to me it may have been human your human decisions which led to that and if you're innocent it may be the decisions taken by someone else which has affected you so it's not the lord who has afflicted it's the wrong decisions taken by either you or uh, other people which have led to this situation and the second lesson that we can learn is don't judge god too quickly the story is not over yet you still have many many more years to go you do not have any idea what wonderful plans the lord has in his heart for you so don't pass your judgment too quickly and say oh the lord has brought misfortune upon me from now on my name is mara no your name is not mara your life is not over there is still a future awaiting and there is a living god who is still watching over you he has not labeled you mara so do not label yourself mara your life has not been uh, reduced to one of bitterness you do not know what the future holds for you yet so naomi spoke those words too soon too early uh, in her blindness and now she admits and, and she says my goodness this lord this yahweh has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead why does she talk about uh, god blessing you know her dead husband and her dead sons because she says that man boaz is our close relative he is one of our guardian redeemers okay so uh, she is happy uh, now that she is seeing the hand of god so let us not be like naomi who will wait till things start improving and then praise the lord rather let us be people who by faith even when you are when we are in that in the dark time of pain and hurt even at that time let us be people who will trust this yahweh and still continue to hold on to him you know this that's what it says right in philippians chapter 4 verses 4 to 6 if someone could just read out that for us because um this is a lesson which naomi should have you know uh, grasped and even if naomi did not we who have the holy spirit living in us definitely should follow this commandment philippians chapter 4 verses 4 to 6 if someone could read out rejoice in the lord always again i sh- i will say rejoice let your gentleness be known to all men the lord is at hand be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your re- request be made known to god yeah so yes naomi did not know the lord as well as we new testament people you know we know the lord but if she had understood that she would have continued to rejoice in the lord always it doesn't say rejoice in the lord when things are going well it says rejoice in the lord always because this this lord this yahweh can be trusted even when things are very very dark even when other people's wrong decisions have affected your life you can continue to rejoice always because he will come through therefore it says do not be anxious about anything so you are the you are the innocent party you didn't take the decision someone else took the decision but now you are paying the consequences even in such a situation rejoice in the lord always do not be anxious but place your you know uh, requests before him with thanksgiving knowing that he will definitely help you so with thanksgiving with that confidence place your requests before him you know so that that's a lesson that we can draw from this now coming to this whole uh, you know concept of how the lord was also blessing the uh, um, showing kindness to the dead Uh, of now uh, you know the dead the, the dead family members of naomi 
uh, we would have to look at a couple of property laws to understand this whole um, concept of the guardian redeemer, the kinsman redeemer. Uh, so yeah, if we could maybe first read Leviticus 25, verse 25. Leviticus 25, 25. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Okay, so it says over here uh, that if someone sells their property, then the nearest relative should redeem what they have sold. Because the Lord said, each tribe has been given a certain amount of land and each family in that tribe has been given a certain portion. And the Lord wants each person to be, each family to continue having their portion of land. So in times of poverty, if anyone sells their portion to someone else, the Lord says, you know, uh, the closest relative should come forward to help that person and repurchase the land and give it back to them. So that is the uh, that is the commandment which the Lord placed. So now Naomi is hopeful. She's hoping that because Boaz is a rich man with many, many fields, she's hoping that maybe he will be willing to buy back the property of Elimelech, which Elimelech had sold. You know, when then they all shifted and moved off to Moab. So Naomi is now hopeful that because Boaz is a close relative, he will be willing to shell out the money to repurchase the land which has been sold. But her hope is even higher than that. She's expecting something more beyond that. Um, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 25. Um, maybe verses 5 and 6. Yeah, Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has, has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as, a, as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will uh, su succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be bloated out of Israel. Now, this is a different commandment. Over here, it's talking about brothers. So it says over here that if a brother has married and then he dies without having a single child, okay, so before he can have any children, he dies, then one of his unmarried brothers it becomes his responsibility to marry the widow so that when a child is born, that child will continue to bear the name of the dead brother. So that very first born who is born out of this you know, union, the second union, that very first born will not bear the name of the living brother. That first born child will continue to bear the name of the dead brother which also means when it comes to property rights, all the property which originally belonged to the dead brother will go to this firstborn, and he will have the name of the first uh, of the of the dead of the dead brother. So to continue the name of the dead brother, so that the dead brother's name is not forgotten and wiped out. So that is the intention. Now Boaz is definitely not the brother of you know um, uh, Ruth's dead husband, but. Naomi is hoping that maybe he'll be willing to do even this. And this is actually not very advantageous for the person who needs to do this. Why? When you purchase the property of someone who has lost their property, you know, you, 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 you shell out your money and you purchase that property and you give it to that poor relative, you get to share in the profits. So yes, it's your money. You invest the money and you buy back the land and the land does not come into your name. The land is not registered in your name. The land continues to be in the name of the poor person you know, to whom you have given it back. So the property deed will continue to be in the name of the original person. But 
you will get to share in that profits for the rest of your life so it's a good investment so if a poor relative of yours has you know lost their land and you are the closest relative you will be the guardian redeemer the kinsman redeemer you will go and purchase that land with your money and give it back to the to the poor to the poor relative the property deed will continue being in the name of the poor relative but you will be having a share in the profits for the rest of your life it's a good investment but in this other uh, you know the leverage system which is mentioned in deuteronomy 25 if a living brother marries the widow and then the first born does not even get to bear his name the first born has the name of the dead brother and then there are more children born you know they have another three three four sons these other three four sons will not get any share in that property of the first born even though the you know the living brother is shelling out his money every year to maintain that property to grow crops on it to pay the laborers who are working on it he's putting in all the investment but when the child that first born grows up he will have the name of the dead brother all the property will go to him all his other children will not be able to get any of that so in a way it's disadvantages to do this uh, so but naomi is hoping that boaz will not only just redeem the land he will even be willing to marry ruth and not have his name any more his name will not be given any importance the first born will have the name of mahalon who is the uh, dead husband of ruth and so um, all the investment which boaz will be doing in that you know land which is repurchased it will all go into mahalon's name and boaz's name will get wiped off as the generations go by so naomi is having very high expectations boaz is not really obliged to do this because boaz is not mahalon's brother but naomi is hoping for this and so with that intention in mind um you know she comes up with a scheme which we see in chapter 3 so when we get into chapter 3 we see the contrast between naomi and ruth naomi comes up with a scheme which is very dishonorable not a not not a not a scheme which decent people would come up with she wants to manipulate and somehow force boaz into marrying ruth so she comes up with a scheme which is not very nice in fact you know she should have thought about how it will affect ruth she is asking ruth to go in the night time to a barn out in the fields and to lie over there you know with a man what if somebody finds out what will it do to her reputation i mean this girl has left everything her homeland her people her idols she has left everything and come over here and naomi is kind of you know coming up with a scheme which can destroy her reputation but you know now when, when ruth um, when when naomi suggests this to ruth ruth says in ruth chapter 3 verse 5 i will do whatever you say you know she just humbles herself and she obeys her mother in law so the mother in law's idea is that she should somehow you know uh, seduce um, boaz into agreeing you know into uh, marrying so which is why she advises her nurses wash put on perfume get dressed in your best clothes and then go over there to the barn and then boaz because he's a good man you know he'll not want your name to be spoiled so then he'll become willing to marry you a very not a very honorable scheme at all instead she should have trusted yahweh let yahweh work out things in his own way who is the one who took ruth to the fields of boaz the lord made arranged it so will the lord not take care of the other details but this is no naomi's dishonorable scheme you know um, it kind of reminds us about the moabite women of numbers 25 in numbers 25 it is the moabite women who indu who, who seduced the uh, israelite uh, men into immorality and into idol worship but this moabite woman ruth so different from the from the from the moabite women of numbers 25 she is an honorable pure woman of god 
And uh, so Naomi is asking her to behave like the women or the Moabite women of Numbers 25. It's not a right thing which Naomi did. But anyway, Ruth, you know, uh, obeys. She humbles herself and she willingly goes over there to that barn. And then um, um, uh, when, uh, when Boaz, you know, he wakes up in the night and he discovers that she's lying over there. He, uh, he, in fact, he's also concerned for her reputation. And uh, there's this conversation which takes place between them. Uh, so in Ruth chapter 3, verse 9 onwards, um, yeah, uh, maybe we could read out verses um, 9 and 10. Yeah. And he said, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. So Boaz is an old man, not exactly a young person. So when she comes over there humbly, and then she says, you know, I mean, uh, spread the corner of your garment. That's symbolic. Uh, you know, it's like a, it's like a ceremony uh, where if you're taking responsibility for someone, you spread the corner of your garment over that person, uh, symbolizing that from now on, this person is my responsibility or something like that. You know, so uh, Ruth says, do that for us because you are the, uh, you are one of our, uh, close relatives, one of our guardian redeemers. So please do that for our family. And Boaz is impressed and this is what he says, this kindness which you're showing now is greater than that which you showed earlier. Because earlier you came with your mother-in-law, you made sacrifices, you chose to you know work in the fields for her. But now you are willing to marry an old man for her sake. After coming here, you know, after getting to know the locals a little bit, you could have opted, maybe you know, looked for someone else who's a, who would be a better marriage, um, you know, uh, option. But you are willing to even marry an old man for, for the sake of your mother-in-law. What kindness, you know? So he admires her uh, for her commitment, and then um, he says in verse eleven, he says, uh, "And now, my daughter, don't be afraid." I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. I mean, what a high compliment to be given. He says, all the people in the town know by now know who you are. And they know that you are a woman of noble character. So don't worry. I will help you. There is a younger person who is a closer relative than me. So if he is willing... You know, um, uh, I you know he can be your kinsman redeemer. So the, so that is what um, he he says, and he says to her um, in verse thirteen, stay here for the night, um, and um, also he says in uh, verse fourteen, he says, you know, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. So he's guarding her reputation, is guarding his own reputation. So he says, stay here for the night. But early in the morning, get up and leave so that, you know, nobody gets to know that your mother-in-law made you come over here so that your reputation is not harmed and my reputation is not harmed. So with those good words, with that kind words, he sends her, uh, you know, back in the morning. And so the very next day, uh, he goes to the gateway where you basically have all the legal proceedings taking place. So near the gate gateway of a particular city is where you have uh, the important elders, you know, seated over there for uh, different, um, you know, official matters. So over there, he he invites this um, younger kinsman redeemer to come over there, and he places the matter before him. Uh, all of this will be in your Ruth chapter four, and so he says to him, so. Uh, you know, are you willing to redeem the property? Are you willing to, you know, shell out your money to repurchase all the land and put it in the name of Elimelech and Mahalom? So it will not be in the Redeemer's name. The property will, will continue to be in the name of Elimelech and Mahalom. But this man would have to pay for it. He would have to purchase it. 
and this is what the man replies in in your uh, verse 4 uh, so he he says i will redeem it the man says he agrees and then in verse 5 boaz says on the day you buy the land from naomi you also acquire ruth the moabite the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property at this the guardian redeemer said then i cannot redeem it but because i might endanger my own estate so you see he would be investing a lot of money and effort upon this property of elimelech he says i don't want to put in that much effort because the child who is born to this moabite and me will continue to have mahlon's name and all the my investment will go to him it will no longer be in my name under my lineage and my other children will not benefit so he says if the, if you, if i also have to marry the lady then no i am not interested in redeeming so this younger person refuses to do it and so then at that point of time boaz says all right in that case i will do it so you know he he chooses to um, both purchase the land and also marry uh, ruth the moabite so this is what um, boaz does for a poor relative you know who really didn't have much status uh you know any any kind of social status uh, or any kind of finances boaz was a rich man he was uh, you know well known and respected in that town he could have married someone who is of his uh, social standing but he is willing to marry this uh, ruth because he respects her admires her and uh, he is willing to help naomi by doing this so both Ruth and Naomi both Ruth and Boaz are showing a great level of favor and kindness towards one old lady she is not a very important lady she is just an old lady but here you have Boaz and Ruth both working really hard to help this one insignificant old woman it literally shows the quality of their heart the kind of character that these two uh, you know people had and so we have this very western rather silly idea of you know uh, the book of ruth being a love story it's not really a love story of boaz and ruth if at all you want to call it a love story it's the story of the love which they were showing towards an old woman who really was not very important or significant they valued her and for her sake they were willing to make sacrifices on their side you know both of them both boaz and ruth to be able to do something for this old lady and here was this old lady who said at the beginning of the story oh i am bitter stop calling me now homi look at the way yahweh you know lifted her up maybe because she really was an innocent party you know when she had to go to moab maybe it was her husband's decision you know to take them all over there to a place which was not even uh, under god's approval so uh, you know as usual we are out of time so it's rather sad we will not be able to cover some of the other details which are there but do notice one thing look at that now you know genealogy which is there at the end of ruth chapter 4 over there you have the genealogy of perez being given okay the genealogy starts with perez perez for your information is not the forefather of elimelech perez is not the forefather of mahlon Perez is the forefather of Boaz. The Lord chooses to put Boaz's lineage, even though the firstborn, you know, of uh, uh, Ruth and Boaz, uh, he is supposed to carry on the name of Mahlon, and he would have, you know, in their culture. But when it came to the legal records of the scriptures, the Lord actually chose to put Boaz's name because the Lord was honoring this man. for the stand which he took in helping two poor helpless women so it is actually boaz's name which is included over here in the royal lineage out of which david will come and later out of which the messiah will come so the lord in his own way honored boaz by putting in his lineage over here 
because actually it, it should have been Elimelech's lineage which is being mentioned over here. But the Lord, in his own way, lifted up Boaz for what he did for these people. Okay, so we see that um, one detail. All right, we are out of time as usual. So let's just conclude with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for the lessons that we could learn from this book. We pray, O oh Lord, that like uh, Ruth, we will place ourselves under your wing, O oh Lord. Help us to be loyal like she was loyal. She was willing to give up all of her idols to come and be uh, your follower to worship you. Enable us to have that same attitude. And Lord, enable us not to be too much like Naomi. Naomi was a good witness who shared about Yahweh with her daughters-in-law. But Lord, in her, when it came to decisions, she was not always very trusting in you. But Lord, enable us to be people who will trust you, who will not go in for compromises or dishonorable schemes, but who will trust you to take care of our situations. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we will have a higher level of faith than uh, Naomi did. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we would be like Boaz, who even though he had status and riches, he chose to take interest in the lives of two penniless women and showed them great mercy and kindness. He reflected the character of Yahweh in the way he lived. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be that kind of salt and light. It's easy to talk about being salt and light, but Lord, being salt and light involves this kind of a sacrifice. So we pray that we will actually bring light into people's lives, that we will actually be salt that will flavor their lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.